This is the somberest looking group of people who are finally allowed to leave the house that I've ever seen. Where, where's the joy that you're not at home right now? It's pretty exciting, right? No matter what, it's exciting to be anywhere other than your living room. You still get to look at a screen the whole morning. You can still do it. And it changes. I can hear you. Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Lights Church. Today is a good day. Can somebody just agree with that? Come on. Listen, I, I heard God speak this morning uh, in my, my private time, and um, he, he dropped a, a scripture on my heart that I wanted to share with you. Here we are. It's May 31st, 2020, right? And everybody has seen the numerous memes about how when we look at 2020, we're not even going to believe that this year happened, right? We've got murder hornets. Right, we've got some of the craziest things, monkeys stealing coronavirus from the labs. Like it's insane some of the stuff that we're seeing. But tomorrow starts June 1st. And I really heard God, God dropped Isaiah 43:19 into my heart. He said, "Behold, I am doing a new thing." The amazing thing that God does is he takes what was meant for evil, he turns it into good. He takes all of these things that we can't even understand how they're going to work together for our benefit, but Romans 8, 28 says it's going to. And so we as Christians need to rise up at this moment. This is our time. The Bible says that we were born for such a time as this. I want you to remember that you could have been born at any time, history past or history future, but God designed your life to be planted right here at this specific time in history. And it's for a reason. Every one of us has a purpose here on this planet, and it involves 2020, right? 2020 is not just something that happened to us. 2020 is something we were created for. That joy that God has put on, on the inside of us that won't go away, that's yours to give to the world. That peace that the world didn't give so the world didn't, can't take away, that is yours to provide to the world, to show them what Christianity looks like compared to to the depression and the somberness that exists in our world today. So please, Christians, Jesus lovers, take hope that you were born for today. It's not an accident that you're here. So Lord Jesus, if you would just stand up, let's pray, let's worship. Lord Jesus, we thank you that this is not an accident. God, we don't necessarily want to be around here right now. Some of us are excited that... Uh, 
that some of us are getting off the planet in rocket ships. But at the same time, Lord, we are so grateful that we get to be here in your presence, that we get to be used by a God who loves his creation, who calls us children. And so, Lord, use us during this season. Wear us like a glove. Use us as mouthpieces, God, to deliver the good news of Jesus Christ that has not changed just because 2020 is weird. The good news is still that Jesus came, Jesus did amazing miracles, Jesus died, Jesus rose from the grave, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and someday he's coming again to take his church home. But right now we are called to occupy this earth and to bring about the kingdom of heaven here. And so, Lord Jesus, we give you glory, and we ask you to be glorified, magnified, highly exalted in this place as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing, but not alive. excited to be here this morning? Are you excited that Jesus came, that Jesus died and he rose from the dead? I don't know, it's something to get excited about. We got our kids in here with us this morning, and I think it's really important that we show them what it looks like to love Jesus. We show them what, it's lo what it looks like to be excited about sports. We show them what it looks like to be excited about all these things, but what about Jesus? That should bring more excitement to us than anything else on this planet. So let's rejoice right now in what he did for us. Amen? Yeah? I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. The chains break at the weight of your glory. I was an orphan. I needed shelter. Now you call me a citizen of heaven.
praise this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are worthy, God. So worthy, Jesus. Oh, what amazing grace. More than my words can say. Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come. In all my weaknesses, you are my confidence. Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come. And I will rise, stand free.
Jesus, you're so worthy. Jesus, you're so worthy of praise and worship. I'm caught up in your presence. And I just want to see. Caught up in this holy moment, I never want to leave. Oh, I'm not here for blessings, and Jesus, you don't know me anything, and more than. I just want you. Come on, let's sing it. I'm caught up in your presence. Oh, I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy
Come on, just close your eyes and bow your heads for a moment. Father, we just confess right now that we just not only want you, but we just need you. We don't need anything else, Jesus. We don't need money. We don't need uh, popularity, God. We don't need the government, Lord. We don't need help from outside, Lord. We need for the kingdom to rise within us and transform our nation, our city, and the world, Father. Jesus, I pray that you'd be exalted this morning in power, that you would reveal yourself with signs, wonders, and miracles following Lord, that you would back your word this morning with power, Father. Lord, we have not come to play church. We have not come to just hear a message. We have not come to just gather as the church and sing a few songs. We have come, Lord, to exalt the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we say there is no other hope for our city. There's no other hope for our state, for the nation, for the world, for any family, for any brokenhearted. You are the answer, Jesus, and we exalt you, and we put every other false idol down, Lord, of distractions, things of the enemy, God, where the enemy would try to creep in and turn our attention from the main thing. Lord, this morning, we come back to our first love, Jesus. We say we love you with all of our hearts, God. We give you everything. We give you our future. Lord, we give you our plans, Father. We give you our marriages and our children and our families, Lord, and everything that's to come, our job situation, our financial situation. Lord, with the coronavirus and all this chaos in the world, Father, we just speak peace right now that the King of Kings would be exalted and revealed in this season. Lord, we love you. Lord, I just pray that you would anoint my lips of clay this morning, that I would deliver only your word and nothing else, that no flesh would glory in your presence today. And Lord, that we'd have a fresh revelation that we are not religious. We're not about just Christianity, but we're about kingdom. We're about who we are, not just what we do, Father. So I pray for a revelation of royalty today, of righteousness today, that we are your children. We've come to exalt you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone said, come on, everybody said, Amen, amen. Well, it's good to see everyone this morning. Welcome to Life's Church. I was going to do what I'm about to do during worship, but I feel like the Lord wanted me to kind of transition and talk to you guys for just a moment. So I want you to give an air high five, an air hug, a smile, however you do it, and just say welcome to Life's Church as you're being seated this morning. <laughs> Total silence with the air hugs. Hey. Thank you, worship team. Awesome today. Appreciate you guys. We needed more smoke. I felt like, you know, God only moves when it's really smoky, so we need to add that next week. No. Well, it's good to see everyone today. I want to, uh, first of all, welcome everyone online. We have a great majority of our church that is watching through Facebook or YouTube right now, and we just, come on, everyone turn around, look at the cameras, and just wave and say, you should be here right now, but we love you. No, I'm kidding. We love you guys, and uh, I, I, I'm glad you're joining us today. Um, I'm excited about, there's a lot of things that are going to happen this morning. I've been praying all week, and I have a word from God. Someone say amen to that. Because it's not a word from man, because a word from man doesn't carry power with it. And so I ask that whenever I deliver God's word, that he backs it with power. And so I'm believing for a manifestation in your life where you don't have a doubt that the word of the Lord came forth. And uh, before we kind of go into what we're going to uh, minister on today, I want to address a few issues today. How many of you guys have ever heard me talk about Hebrews chapter 12 and how the truth, the Bible says, or the word is like a two-edged sword. Remember I said, come on, if the truth is going forth, forth, there'll be some cutting that takes place, right? Because we know that when truth comes forth, it pierces your heart. 
You know, when Jesus spoke to, many times in the scripture, it says it pierced them or cut them to the heart. And so I want to just give you some truth today that might cut you to the heart. But I like to say, if you're not bleeding, I didn't do my job. No, so I don't mean like in a bad way. But I want to really set some things straight this morning. I've been praying all week about the situation in our world. Uh, if you have not heard my message three weeks ago, I believe it was on Are We in the Last Days? You need to listen to that. Uh, because it's not a weird message. It's not me being like, you know, hyper spiritual or anything like that. But we go through prophetic scriptures and talk about how we are living in the prophesied time through all generations that when they said, the end will come when these things happen. And can I just tell you, we're living in those times. And that message, I give undeniable proof, not just the word of God and the truth of the word, but we give actual facts and even mathematically prove it from prophecy. So I'd encourage you to listen to that because it will give you perspective for the time that we're living in. If you don't recognize we're living in the days that were prophesied, then you're not going to have context to what's happening. How many guys would agree that the world is in a state of chaos? Come on, raise your hand. The world is in a state of chaos. I mean, it seems to increase regularly. You can watch the news and then look in the book of Ezekiel and the book of Daniel and see it lining up exactly the way God said. I want to read a scripture um, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that just talks about the state of the world we're living in, and then I'm going to cut all of you with the word of God, and you're going to love it so much. You're going to be like, Pastor, that's great, and you're bleeding everywhere, but it's going to change your life this morning, okay? So 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 1. This is not the message. This is the preliminary message, only about three hours of this, and then I'll get into the message. Verse 1 says, but know this. Now, this is Paul describing the last days. I, I think you'll see how it looks exactly like the generation that we're living in now. Come on, the truth's going to come forth hardcore. You better get ready for this. It says, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. That word perilous also means stressful times will come. Another definition of that word is hard to deal with or painful it also means difficult, dangerous, dangerous, and then my favorite one, savage. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, this is savage times. Come on. So perilous times, stressful times will come. Did you notice he didn't say in the last days it's going to be easier? Scripture tells us that in the last days it will be harder. Not harder to serve God, not harder to walk with Jesus, but for the world it will be harder. So today I want to kind of shift you out from a natural mindset facing the issues that we're facing in the world today with your mind or with your emotions or your opinions and i want to take you over to a kingdom mindset so you'll have proper perspective verse two says for men come on that includes women too will be love okay it's just for the guys will be lovers of themselves lovers of money boasters proud blasphemers disobedient to parents boys do you hear that uh <laughs> not you other kids uh unthankful unholy unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Now, over the last few weeks, we've been talking about the kingdom of God and kingdom culture. And one of the things we discussed is that we are not religious people, if you are a follower of Christ, and Jesus was not a religious leader. When we present Jesus as a religious leader, we take the power out of the gospel. I like to tell people, they say, well, what do you do for a living? And it always gets awkward when you tell them you're a pastor, right? At first, they're real cool with you, and you're like, oh, I'm a pastor, and they're like, oh, Sorry, I've been cussing this whole time. I mean, I know I should be in church. I mean, I know. I'm like, dude, I, I just said I'm a pastor. Like, it's cool. Like, you know, I'm not judging you. But, you know, there, in, in the times that we're living in, it's important that we understand who we are, that we're kingdom people. Jesus not just was, but is a king. And when you relate to him as a king, and we realize that the Bible is not a Christian book. That just cut some of y'all right there. You just got mad. You're like, Pastor, I don't know about this church anymore. Some of y'all are visiting today, and you're like, dude, I knew it was crazy. I, I saw him before service. He looked wild. Well, it's not a Christian book. Can I tell you? The word Christian is only in the Bible three times. Two of the times it was spoken by people who were unbelievers. One time it was used in a way that we use it today. It doesn't mean we're not Christians or followers of Christ. We are. But 
Christianity has a connotation with it in our society today that many of us apply a religious mindset to that does not properly reflect how the scripture tells us we should relate to God. We are a part of a kingdom. You know in a kingdom what the king says goes? You know you don't get votes in the kingdom of God? Some of you don't like that. You're like, I don't like that scripture. Doesn't matter, right? Because the king said it. And so we need to understand that the power is taken away whenever we become religious because then sin follows. Okay, I'm going to get to the point here. So verse 10 says, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Say, out of them all. So the Lord will deliver you out of every situation that the enemy throws your way if you're in his will. Very big if right there. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. But evil men and imposters will grow. We're talking about the last days. Worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So the Bible says deception will increase evil people. Come on. Are there evil people out there? I'm about to talk about what happened this week, and I'm about to slap everybody around. So just let, say, yes, Pastor, there are evil people out there. Okay. Um, evil people will increase. And the Bible says, but how do we handle that? Verse 15. Uh, excuse me, verse 14. You must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. For all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for repute, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. That's the purpose of the word of God. Now, the last four verses here, I'm going to skip over to uh, chapter 4, verse 1. I charge you, therefore, before God and all the Lord Jesus, and who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Don't preach your opinions. Don't preach popular culture. Don't preach what you think. Preach the word. Someone say amen to that. And so today I'm going to preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Do you see that? What is the job of the man ministering the word? To convince, to rebuke, to exhort with patience and with teaching. For the time will come, and I believe we're in that season now, when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. They will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you, on the other hand, be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of the evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. Now, here's what I want you to see. The scripture describes the last days to us, and it says that we need to be grounded in the word of God and the truth more than ever before to sustain ourselves in these last days and to overcome the work of the enemy. The word of God is the principal thing. Now, today is Pentecost Sunday. Has anyone ever heard the words Pentecost Sunday? It's also called Shavuot for my Jewish brothers and sisters. Um, It's the Feast of Weeks. It is 50 days or seven weeks from Passover. And so today is very significant And I think as I go into this, you'll see how it fits perfectly with what we're going through, even as a nation right now and in the world. In Pentecost, what if you know the scripture, when Jesus ascended to heaven, he said, go into the upper room. Hey, can y'all turn the smoke down just a little bit? I can't see anybody's face. It just looks like everybody's in the glory cloud. (laughs) Just turn it down. We did it because these beams show in the smoke. Aren't those cool? We added those. I don't know. I thought they looked good on camera. Anyway, it's a little ADD. But um, and so we're talking about. The Pentecost. So what happened? Jesus said, go into the upper room and pray. And then what did he say? He said, don't leave that room. Don't stop. Don't change. Don't be distracted. Don't do anything else until the Holy Spirit or the gift from the Father comes into the church. And he will empower you to be my witnesses in the earth. So the church can't be the church properly unless the Holy Spirit is actively working through the church. Because it becomes religious when the Holy Spirit's not doing it. Because then we're just going through the motions. I don't know about you. How many of you guys grew up in church? Anyone here kind of grew up in church? Okay, raise your hand if you're like new to church and, and, and you maybe as an adult you started coming to church. Some of you out there? Okay. Well, I grew up in church, and I'm telling you, whenever you go through a religious motion for a period of time, you become jaded and inoculated to the power of the gospel. 
And my job in this season, the Lord has told me, is to preach the kingdom and wake up the church and change our perspective and our thinking from just doing Christianity to being the children of God in the church. Sunday morning is not church. Sunday morning is when the church gathers together and worships. When this building is locked up, church didn't close. Come on, if you Google up a church right now, it'll say close and have hours. <laughs> okay, religion says that, right? It's like, oh, is the church open? Oh, y'all close at 6? Cool. No more church after 6 p.m. until 9 the next morning. Now, that might sound kind of like, you know, like minuscule, like why is he magnifying that? Because it's a way of thinking that has taken God and put him in a box and minimized what God wants to do in the earth. You're salt and light. Salt's not good by itself. Come on, it has to be on the steak. And a lot of us like to stay, stay, in the, stay in the salt shaker and be salty together, and we're the light. We blind each other on Sunday. We're like, oh, this is great. So much light in here, so much holiness. Oh, I love just being around Christians. It's so safe and so good. And Jesus said the exact opposite of what I called you to do. Charge each other up and then start being the church on Monday. No one's saying amen to that, but it's good. So, so Passover, what did Jesus say? He said, stay in the upper room until the Holy Spirit comes. Now, what held back? the coming of the Holy Spirit for those 10 days that they prayed. Like, why didn't he come immediately or within five minutes? Acts chapter 2 tells us something happened and then the Holy Spirit came. Do you want to know? Not a trick question. They were in one accord. Unity brought the power of the Holy Spirit in the church, which transformed the world. The early church was kicking our tail, if I can be totally honest. There's kids in here, so I said it nicely. But they, they really were. I mean... Thousands added a day, miracles, the dead being raised, governments being, I mean, transformed, nations being changed. What was the difference? Can I tell you the whole, same Holy Spirit's here, the same gospel is here, but somehow we've taken the power out of it in a lot of ways, not everywhere. There's a lot of great moves of God happening around the world. But we've taken the power out of it, and I'll tell you this. Unity is the factor or the difference maker that brings power into the church. The Holy Spirit will not move in strife. So guess what the enemy's doing to the church right now? Trying to bring division. All right, this is why I'm going to step on some toes. Just smile and say amen. What happened this week with George Floyd was not only injustice, not only wrong, not only a terrible situation, not only an evil situation, a hateful situation, but even... Deeper than that, it was and is now demonic. The enemy is wreaking havoc in our nation right now. And I learned something about how to deal with the devil. And let me give you a little hint right here. When you expose him, there's a scripture in Colossians. I learned this in Bible school. I thought it was hilarious and great. And so I use it when I was a youth pastor a lot. But did you know there's a scripture in Colossians that in the Greek language talks about Jesus making a show of Satan openly? And it actually means he made him march naked through the streets of the kingdom after Jesus died and rose again. He stripped him of everything he had and exposed him and the demons and had marched them naked. Now, obviously, he's not a physical being. He's not literally naked, but naked, exposed for who he is. Because he comes as an angel of light. His master weapon is deception. And so if you want to weaken Satan's or the enemy's kind of hold in your life or in the season of life you're in, expose him and it weakens him. If you ignore him, you strengthen him. This is good. You want to write this down. When you ignore the enemy, you strengthen him. How many of you guys were scared of the dark when you were a kid? Be honest. Come on, kids. How many of y'all go through that? You're scared of the dark. How many of y'all adults still a little bit are? You know what I'm talking about? Like if you get up to use the restroom in the middle of the night and it's dark and you're like, oh, you like hear something? Nobody else does? I don't do that. I'm just saying, okay, Austin does. But what happens, when you were a kid, I remember kind of laying in my bed and thinking, man, there's like a, you know, a monster in the closet or under the bed. And I would sit there, and I was like, if I just be quiet and act like he's not here, he'll leave me alone, right? We take that into our life sometimes with the enemy. We don't recognize what he's doing. We ignore him. We turn our attention everywhere else but the root of the issue. And instead of him being weakened or kind of going invisible or moving away, it inflames him and empowers him whenever you ignore him. So I'm about to expose him right now. Now, there's a scripture in the Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And it talks about, in, in Galatians chapter 6 verse 2 as well. Galatians 6 2 talks about bearing one another's burdens. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says, we are the body of Christ. When one part suffers, 
we all suffer. I'm going to tell you what God told me to say today. When one part suffers, we all suffer. When one part is honored, we all rejoice. Have you ever been on social media and seen how somebody got blessed with something and it made you mad because you, you didn't get blessed with something? You know what I'm talking about? And you're like, I know, they got a new car, and that must be nice. And God blessed them, but I believed the car for six months, and I didn't get no car. And so I, don't, I, don't, I hope it breaks down, you know? Kingdom mindset, we're a body. We're kingdom people. Quit dividing yourself up here and recognize who you are right here. When one part suffers, we all suffer as the body of Christ. So I'm going to just tell you all something. With what happened this week with George Floyd, I don't care what your political opinions are and the president and all this and everybody. I, you just go on Facebook for five minutes, and everybody likes to just spew all of their opinions. Remember, kingdom, you're not entitled to an opinion. Can I just tell you this, too? Jesus said, I don't even, as the Son of God, say anything my Father doesn't say first. I don't do anything my Father doesn't do first. So the scripture says if one person or one part suffers, can I tell you there's a, a large portion of the body of Christ right now or our brothers and sisters that are suffering and they have it personal attack that they're going through. They deal with this on a regular basis. I mean, there are things that happen that we all can't relate to because we all look differently on the outside. Even on the inside, God sees you the same. And so it's not legal for you in kingdom terminology to ignore the suffering of a part of the body of Christ. It must be addressed. And we must go through it together. I don't care who you vote for. It doesn't matter. It's not scriptural. You can vote for everyone. Just go whatever. But that, you don't divide yourself on those lines. I don't care what your skin color looks like. We don't divide ourselves. And so we suffer together. We unite together. We're not fighting a political battle. We're fighting a spiritual battle. Ephesians chapter 6 says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Come on but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and wickedness in high places. The Bible tells us that the enemy is spiritual, so you can't fight spiritual battles with natural weapons. And what happens when you fight a spiritual battle with a natural weapon, you're going to get defeated and overthrown, and you're going to get drawn deeper into the chaos instead of overcome it. And so today I want to recognize the spiritual battle without minimizing the natural battle. There is a natural battle. My brother and closest friend, he's on the board of directors for Life's Church, who I grew up with, who's family to me. I mean, my boys call him Uncle Rashad. He's African-American. And I asked him one day years ago, I said, hey, uh, I said, I know you'll shoot straight with me. I was like, just be honest with me because it's a to total different experience that I have than you have. How are you, are you really like seen differently like by police officers? And if y'all know Rashad, like he's the most like straightforward, like non-emotional, not political person on the earth. So I know he's going to tell me. I said, do you really kind of go through, like, tell me about, he's like, yeah. He's like, it's true. He's like, I, I, sometime, and his wife is white, so he's like, it's even worse. You know, like, then I just really have some issues. I was like, okay, so talk to me about it. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to minimize the natural circumstance here. There, we all experience different things by the life we live. Male, female, black, white, Hispanic, you know, what age you are, all the things you go through. The enemy, but here's the deal. That's the fruit, not the root. And so we have to attack the root as the body of Christ because if we all start cutting fruit off, guess what's going to happen? It's just going to grow right back. And what did Jesus say? The world will know the church not by miracles, not by how great our services are, not even by how all of our good works. He said they'll know you by your love one for another. The church more than any time in history has to unite, back each other, move forward with one voice, be in unity as family, and attack the enemy in one voice and in one accord and not allow the enemy to divide us because of opinions or because you don't understand what somebody else goes through. So I just tell all of you in here, we stand with you. I recognize what happened this week is a horrific thing. And let me just throw something else out that might make you mad. Um, I, uh, I was kind of studying the Lord spoke to me. He said, Jason, what have I taught you about reaction? And, and the Lord reminded me, I said, you told me never to react, only to respond. Can I just tell you, you'll learn that when you get married, if you're not married yet. Don't react, just respond. Respond means calculated, prayerfully, planned out, knowing what you're doing, and not emotionally reacting. Because when you react, the Bible says you're snared by the words of your mouth. I mean, there was a, there was a whole kind of movement this week about, man, if you don't comment in the next 13 minutes, then you don't care. And I was like, oh, man, I got, I got to put out a statement. I got to say, and the Holy Spirit said, what did Jesus say? I said, what do you mean? He said, don't do anything you don't see me do, and don't say a word until I tell you to say it. 
He said, because I'm going to tell you what to say on Sunday, and it's going to come in power and bring change and unity, and you are not going to react emotionally, because I reacted emotionally at first. I watched the video, I got mad, and I was like, ah, oh, and I just wanted to react. And the Lord said, stop, listen to what I'm saying. Because we are not going to give the enemy the ability to move us by our emotions. We acknowledge the issue, we attack it, but we do it from a spiritual standpoint. And here's how you change the world. Are you ready? From the inside out. You want to change America? Guess what? Another law is not going to just do it. Laws need to change, yes, and we need to go up. But can I just tell you something? The kingdom is how change happens. I just, I'm real blunt up here. This is okay. And so I'm not, I'm just going to hit it straight up. That officer was not a kingdom man. For if he were a kingdom man, he would not have that type of hatred and hardness in his heart. The way to change the world is to take the kingdom and deposit it into other hearts. We can make a law and we can do all the things we need to do. But if the body of Christ is so focused on just reacting to the circumstance, we forget the main thing Jesus said to do. He said to go out and be salt and light. There are people that are hateful, that are disobedient to parents, that are blasphemers, that are unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control. They need us to be who God made us to be because the light pushes out darkness. We have to shine for darkness to leave. Light and darkness don't coexist. And so it's important that the church, number one, is in unity. So we're going to pray in just a moment for all those that are online. And we're going to come into unity. We're going to, when one part suffers, we're going to suffer with them. And so right now, our African-American brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, and even those without, are suffering. And so we're going to suffer with them. You don't get a, you don't get a vote. You're like, well, I just don't, I don't, I don't, it doesn't matter. It's kingdom. We're family. The reason Rashad was my best friend, it was selfish at first. But in eighth grade, I was a new kid in school. And I was nerdy. I know y'all can't believe that because the way I look now, but I wasn't the coolest kid in school. <laughs> and so I looked for the biggest kid in the class. I was like, we're going to be best friends. And I looked over, and Rashad was about 6'4 and 300 pounds in eighth grade. I was like, hey, bro, like, can we hang out? You know, like, will you protect me? And so, uh, we, you know, Rashad and I were very close. But you have to recognize, though, in, in, in this season that we're living in, we cover each other when one of us goes through something. You can't ignore the issues that are going on around you. You have to change them, but you do it kingdom-minded. Everyone stand up with me if you would. So we're not reacting. We're responding now. Now, let me ask you something. Is there injustice in the kingdom of God? This is an easy question. Is there injustice in the kingdom of God? No is the answer. Okay. Is there injustice in the kingdom of God? Is there injustice in the world's kingdoms? Yes. As we teach on the kingdom, we have to recognize that the way Babylon was changed was Daniel rose in the ranks because he was a kingdom man, and he changed it from the inside out. And as the body of Christ, we can't fight from the outside in. We come in and take over the kingdoms of this world. We supplant the enemy. And so I got news for you. Some of y'all are outside of the will of God for your life because you've been just doing life or working for a paycheck, and God wants you to come up inside of a situation, inside of the government, inside of society, and change it from the inside out because salt and light goes into a dark place, and it eradicates darkness. And so the church has to now do what we're called to do and eradicate injustice in the earth, eradicate sin, eradicate darkness in the earth. And the only way we can do it is recognizing it's a spiritual battle. How did Jesus say that people would know us? By our love one for another. Now, because we're all kind of doing our spaciousness and everything, I'm not going to ask you to hold the hand of your neighbor, put your arm around them, but I want you just in your heart, we're going to embrace each other and close our eyes, and we're going to pray. We're going to pray for unity in the body of Christ. We're going to pray that the chaos in our nation is going to cease with the coronavirus and with all the riots and all these things, that there will be change that takes place from this, but not just natural change, that a supernatural great awakening would come to our nation because when the nation falls to its knees and turns its uh, face back to God, then healing comes to our nation. We can pass 48 laws and we can vote whoever you want to be in office. It's not going to change a thing because there are only two kingdoms in this earth. There's darkness and there's light. There's not Democrat and Republican. There's not all the different types of people. There's two kingdoms. 
So we're all in the same kingdom. Father, in Jesus' name right now, as a church family, as Life Church, those that are watching online, all of us, we come into unity together. We, first of all, when our brothers and sisters are suffering, we suffer with them, God. We uphold them. We lift them up. We speak healing into their hearts, God, and restoration, Father. Lord, I thank you that that black and white and Hispanic, Latino, Asian, Lord, that the body of Christ would come together in this moment, that we would not be divided, that we would not go the way of politics or the world or opinion or the news media, but God, that the church would stand up as the answer for the world, Lord. We have the answer, God. Lord, forgive us. Come on, I want you to repent on behalf of the church right now. Come on, repent on behalf of your community. Repent on behalf of your type of person, the black, the white, the Asian, the Hispanic, how we've been divided. Father, we repent right now for giving in to the pressures of the world and of pop culture and all the opinions. And God, we come back together, Lord, and we come together as your church and your children who are all related, who back each other. We fight for each other. We cover each other. We press back the forces of darkness together, Lord, and we lock arms in the spirit as the body of Christ. And we say, Satan, no further, no further. We are drawing a line in the sand. You are not going to bring division and destruction into this nation, into the church, but we are going to do the opposite. We are going to unify and we are going to push you back, defeat you, overcome you and destroy your work in this land in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We receive it. And Lord, I thank you that healing would come and what the enemy has meant for evil. You would turn it around for a movement of a great awakening of who you are in this earth. Jesus, be exalted where the enemy has tried to usurp you and take your throne. We cast him down and we put you in your rightful place as king of our lives. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, here's the deal. You can't just pray. The Bible says in James chapter two and not do. So you need to be active now. I didn't say go be an activist. I said be active. And guess what? That means be active with what God tells you to do. It's your job to have a part to play in unity. You need to help bring unity to the body of Christ. Because remember, Acts 2 says unity, Holy Spirit, power, world changed. Starts with unity. And the devil is laughing all the way because we've been fighting every other battle, looking everywhere else, and not recognizing that the church has been doing this. Splintering. Okay, you can be seated. Amen. So, all right, I know everybody's bleeding, so now I'm going to band-aid you up. By the end, we're all going to hug and love each other. It's going to be absolutely great. I'm so ticked off at the devil, though. I've been, I was so mad. I was mad this week, and then I started praying, and I just got more angry. And you know, the Bible says righteous anger is healthy. It's, it's okay. Now, f- emotional anger is not. But you need to get angry when the devil has been wreaking havoc in your life and the lives of those around you or in our nation, and it's been going unchecked. It's not going to happen. And the church has to stand up. But we're not going to stand up based on the pressure of everybody else. We're going to do what Jesus says to do and how he says to do it. Thank you, babe. Okay, so we're in Kingdom Culture Part 3. Now, I'm going to shorten this because I went long on that, but that's a priority to me. And I will continue to minister on that because the Lord is speaking to me on that subject. But we've been talking about the kingdom. And the title of the message today, and I'm going to just do a real quick one here, is Growing Through Seed. Growing Through Seed. Last week and the week before, we learned about the characteristics of the kingdom of God. If we're not a religion, if it's not just about the anity or the Christianity, because when you say Christianity, you're putting it in line with all other world religions. Religion is a way of believing. It's a set of rules that describe a way of belief. The kingdom of God is not based on a set of rules that describe a way of belief. The kingdom of God is based on the king who is not in the grave, who has been resurrected, who has got all power, and he wants to increase his dominion through the church. When you're kingdom-minded, you think dominion. We think, how do we change America? How do we bring healing? We take over. That's what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to hide in a church and say, let's see how big our church can get. Nothing wrong with big churches. Come on, we're growing. Amen. But at the end of the day, it's about inside-out change. The souls of men and women coming into the kingdom, being transformed from the inside out. And as people who truly meet Jesus for who he is, healing comes for whom the son has set free is free indeed. So we're kingdom people. Matthew 6, 24 says this. No one can serve two masters. You got to choose for he will either hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Verse 31. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after these things, the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly father knows that you need all of these things. Verse 33. But seek first 
Christianity. Seek first Sunday morning service at your favorite church locally who has the best preacher, which obviously that's why you're here. But, it, it, you, know, you know, it says seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Righteousness is a confusing word because we don't use it in our modern day vernacular. And righteousness, say, well, what does that mean? It's a kingdom term. It means to be in right standing with the king or with the royalty. So when you're righteous, you're in right standing with the king. You're lined up with him. You're under his authority. It says if you do that, verse 33, all these things that you need that everyone else seeks, seeks will be added to you. So maybe you're not seeing provision because you're not seeking the kingdom. Because the Bible says if you seek the kingdom first, all the things that you need for this life to be effective for God will be added to you. That means you have to go possess them. It means they'll be added. So you're seeking first the kingdom. The Bible says goodness and mercy chases you down. The blessing of God, says, the Bible says it overtakes you from behind. Why? Because you're pursuing the kingdom in Jesus. You're embracing him. The blessing overtakes you. Where a demonic mentality is coming to the church is we say, let's seek all of these things and, and hope God blesses it. God, here's my plans. Bless it. He's like, wait a minute. I don't bless your plans. I bless my plans for your life. And I'm over here, and you're seeking that. I know, God, I need rent money. Come on, you ever been short on money before? That's all you can think about. Come on, be honest. You know, you're like, okay, you know, the mortgage payment's coming up, apartment payment's coming up, and I don't have enough money. And you're just, and the enemy wants you to magnify lack or magnify what you don't have or what you don't need or the problem instead of magnifying Jesus. And even in this situation in America today, we got to make sure that the church is keeping the perspective correct. Who are we magnifying? So we seek first the kingdom because our supply comes from the kingdom. Now, here's the uh, six characteristics we went through, and I'll talk about just one today. We talked about sonship is a culture characteristic of the kingdom. Fellowship, not religion, but relationship. Number three, provision. Number four, influence. Number five, dominion. Number six, authority. And this is one of my favorite ones, and I'm preaching about today. Number seven is seed, a characteristic of kingdom people. We are seed people. We think in terms of sowing and in terms of seed. You might hear me talk about sowing, and I want to go into that because every major description of Jesus in Scripture about the kingdom involves seed. He always he says the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is like a man who sowed seed into the ground. He's talking about seed when he talks about the kingdom. So if we un want to understand the kingdom, we have to understand the seed. Now, what did God do with Adam in Genesis 1? He see, created Adam and Eve, and he said, Adam and Eve, be fruitful. That's a seed term, right? Seed turns into tree, which turns into fruit. Be fruitful, multiply, have dominion over the earth. See, we got to think takeover. The church has been too scared too long. We're afraid to say, well, you know what we got? Well, I don't know what we got. And, you know, you need to be taken over where God's put you. Wherever your job is, I don't mean just like take over like just financially. I mean, that, yes, we need to do that too. But I'm talking about you need to recognize that the authority is inside of you that's in a higher authority than any authority on the earth. So everywhere you go, the kingdom of God goes. Everywhere your foot treads, God's foot treads because he is in you. And so you have to recognize your neighborhood, if something's going wrong in your neighborhood, it's on us. We're the church. The answer is inside of us. So we can't ignore and hide from darkness or from pain or from destruction. We go right into the middle of it, overcome it with the authority of God. Amen, Pastor. Amazing. So, Adam, be fruitful, multiply. And the first gift God gave Adam and Eve was what? Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 through 29. He gave them seed. He said, be fruitful and multiply. And here, every seed is yours. So you can grow and increase in the earth. Everything God created, he put its full potential inside of it at creation. Your potential is inside of you. The whole point of the word of God and the kingdom message and everything my job to do is to teach and, and grow you is to get the potential out from the inside, outside, to cause it to unlock inside of you. The answer's in you. Everything you need to live this life and fulfill your purpose has already been given to you. That's why I said there's no scripture in the Bible that says pray hard. And the reason I say that is because we think that somehow if we pray hard enough, we can convince God to do something that he's already done at the cross and already given us. And so the enemy gets us in a vicious cycle of always trying to gain and trying to get God to do something instead of recognizing I'm a child of God. Jesus already gave it to me. So I just receive what he's already done for me. It's a different way of looking at it. Serving God shouldn't be hard. Doesn't mean there won't be resistance, but walking with Jesus, he said, when you're with me, it's light and easy. 
The world's chaotic, and you'll go through things out there, but on the inside, you can have peace in any storm. Amen, Pastor. Okay, so Psalm 139, verse 16 says this. My eyes, your eyes saw my substance being unformed, and in your book, listen to this, they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. Here's what the Bible says. When you were in your mother's womb, God wrote every day that he fashioned for your life on this earth before you were even born. And then guess what happened? He put it on the inside of your spirit. So you have to discover and unlock the purpose on the inside of you. There is not one child of God that's meant to live a life that is useless or that is ineffective or that is wasted. You have world-changing power in you. It's different for every one of us. It looks different, but purpose is locked up on the inside of you. Think about the potential of a, an acorn. Acorn's oak, right? Oak tree? I get that. Okay, yeah. So an acorn, right? What happens? Acorn has an entire oak tree in it already. The DNA's in it. But it has to be put in the right circumstance. It has to be planted in the right place. It has to be tended to and covered and watered. And if it's allowed to remain and it's tended to and it's watered, it will become an oak tree, something that small. My mother's got some property and some land, and she's got some oak trees that are hundreds of years old. And, I mean, for this part of town where everything is like mesquite trees and, you know, grass, to see an oak tree with a 15-foot diameter trunk on it is amazing. And to think it started as a seed. You know, every puppy has a dog in it. That was prophetic. Y'all didn't catch that. Birds have flight trapped inside of them. They have to learn. The mother eagle, how she gets her eaglets, that's what they're called, by the way, I looked it up, to fly is she pushes them out of the nest. First, she begins to turn it inside out and all the, the thorns that she made it with, and it's all of a sudden poking those eaglets. And they're like, Mom, this is, what are you doing? This is uncomfortable. Ow, I'm bleeding. That hurts. She's trying to get them to get out of the nest and fly and fulfill their purpose. And sometimes God has to make you uncomfortable and frustrate your circumstance to get you out of your comfort zone to go into the season that he has for you in the next. And the way you do that is you don't remain comfortable. The enemy wants you just to sit back, let all the things of the world happen, everything just, every, whatever happens, you just take it. And God says, no, you can change it. The disciples said, Jesus is a storm, we're all dying. And he woke up and said, what are you talking about? And he changed the storm, spoke peace to it, and went back to sleep. Amen, Pastor. So receiving seeds. I'll go in the next five minutes here because I know a lot of you have short attention spans like me. Okay. Mark chapter 4, this is the last scripture we're going to talk about, and I want you to see the mystery of the kingdom of God. We're talking about the kingdom, we're talking about seed. Jesus said this is the most important thing for you to understand in the Bible, because if you don't understand what I'm about to teach you, then you will not understand anything that the word of God says. That's a powerful statement. Mark chapter 4 verse 10 says, when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parable of the seed. He just told the parable. Verse 11, he said to them, to you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside, all things come in parables, so that seeing they may see and not perceive, hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. Verse 13, and he said to them, do you not understand this parable? Listen to this. How then will you understand all or any of these parables? So Jesus says here, the mystery of the kingdom of God, I'm about to tell you what it is. The, the secret of the kingdom. Come on, there's a secret to the kingdom of God. He says, everyone can't know this, but those that do are going to change the world. Verse 14, the sower sows what? The word. Now, Luke chapter 8, verse 11 is another, the same story in, in the book of Luke, and it says the seed is the word of God. So the first thing Jesus says you need to know about the kingdom of God is that the word of God is the seed of the kingdom. The word is the seed. He said, this is the mystery. Now, once you understand this, you can change the world. Your life will be transformed. So when we say seed, we're talking about the word. Verse 15, these are the ones that were sown by the wayside, which is the hard ground. That's kind of like the, the sidewalk, if you will, the man with scattering seed. The ones that were sown on this wayside or the hard ground where the word is sown, when they hear it, Satan comes immediately, takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. Verse 16, these likewise are the ones sown on stony ground who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. Listen to this, but they don't have any roots, no root in themselves. They only endure for a season. And afterward, when tribulation, persecution arises, frustrating circumstances, things that they don't understand, for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. 
Now these are the ones sown among thorns. They hear the word and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desires for other things enter in and choke out the word. Say choke. Chokes out the word. So the word can be stolen. The word can dry up and and have no way to, to make root because there's no soil, and the word can be choked out. Now the word doesn't cease to exist. It can't be overcome, but the word in your heart can. So it's up to us to protect and to receive this seed. It becomes unfruitful. Verse 20. But these are the ones, say this is about me, are sown, three of y'all good, on good ground, tilled, those who hear the word, accept it and bear fruit, some 30, some 60, and some 100. Now, after we just read this, I'm going to ask you a question. It's very simple. I like participation here. How does the kingdom of God grow based on this scripture? Through what? Seed. Right? Okay, I'll do it again. How does the kingdom of God grow based on this scripture? Through seed. Word seed. So if you want to see God increase in your life, the manifestation of the Bible, miracles are in the Bible and they never said they stopped. So why aren't we seeing as much as we should be? There's a reason for that. Because the Bible says word seed is how the kingdom spreads in the earth and transforms and overcomes all other kingdoms. The word has to go forth. 1 Peter 1.23 says, you have been born again. How? Not of perishable seed, but of imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. How did you accept Christ and become born again? The word was sown into your heart. You held on to it. It changed you on the inside, and you responded to it because you believed it. So seed went inside of you of the word and changed your life. There's no expiration date on word seed. It doesn't expire. The, the same power that had was in the word when Jesus preached it 2,000 years ago is still coming out while I'm preaching it today because it's the same word. There's no expiration date. And so it's up to us on how we relate to the word seed being sown into our life. Do you prioritize it? Are you open to receiving it? Or is pride, is distraction, is other cares of other things, is the enemy using all of these things to stop the word from going into your heart and holding on to it? 1 Corinthians 1.21 says, After that, in the wisdom of God, listen to this, the world by wisdom knew not God. It that sounds like a Wookiee or something. Is that... <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Was that someone's phone? Sorry, I have a hard time focusing. And that really, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. Listen to this: foolishness of preaching to save them that believes. So God transfers His kingdom through the preaching of His word. Why do you come here every Sunday and show up and listen to the word? Why are you watching online? It's because the kingdom is being transmitted through the preaching of the word, and it's going into your life and has the power to revolutionize your life and overcome any obstacle. So God chose preaching of the word to deliver power through. That's how power comes. That's why you need to prioritize hearing the word. You've got to prioritize the word in your life. Come on, say this with me. Say, the word of God is number one in my life. That's how you need to live every day. Not your job, number one. Not sleeping an extra five minutes, number one. You've got to deposit the seed in you every day of the kingdom because that's how it produces 30, 60, and 100 fold. It's not just enough to listen to worship every day. That's great. But it doesn't say worship music is the seed of the kingdom. The sower sows good worship. We need it because worship brings us into the presence of God. But it's a combination of being in his presence and receiving his word. Some of y'all really love worship and you got mad. Okay, I'll say it this way. It's not just enough to have the word. You got to have the presence too. We need both, okay? But you have to deposit seed in you every day. You're constantly sowing. What if a farmer was trying to to reap a harvest on a seed he sowed 10 years ago, and he's mad because he has no more harvest? No, you have to keep sowing. Once you get a harvest, you sow more out of that harvest. You constantly sow seed in your life, and the word must be sown every day. That's why if the kingdom transfers through the preaching of God's word, this is so good. I know I'm going to end in a second. Kids are like, Pastor, come on. Okay. The kingdom transfers through the preaching of the word. So that's why the word is under attack. Can I tell you something? You're not really under attack. You're like, the devil's been attacking me. No, the word inside of you is what he's trying to get to. So you are attacked because of the word in you. So can I tell you something? If the devil's been really working overtime on you, that means there's a threat on the inside of you. The word is there, and he knows if that grows up in them, that's going to ruin my whole plan for their life and what I'm trying to do. 
So he's attacking you to try to steal the word from you. And Jesus says, if you want to understand anything in the Bible, any parable, understand the whole kingdom, understand that the word is seed and how you protect it and receive it will determine how much you get from it. God can only do in your life what you allow him to do. Because God can do anything. Some people say, well, how come God did that for them, not them? It's not God. He doesn't pick favorites. The Bible says he's no respecter of persons. Tall, skinny, short, fat, come on, hairy, bald. We all are loved by him. So it's about, I got distracted on that. Sorry, it's a deep wound I'm going through right now. It's, the kingdom runs on the seed. That's it. Okay, so I'll end with it. Your submission to the seed of the word is equivalent to your effectiveness in this life. How much you allow the word of God to correct change if he plants it in your heart and how you hold it and receive it and treasure it will determine how much God can do in your life. Are you good soil? Hard soil is impervious to the word. That's the first one. It's been walked on, hardened by life, jaded by religious culture. It's become critical, judgmental. Are you a fault-finding person? Do you look at everybody around you and find out what's wrong with them and how they're doing it wrong and if they would just change this and you're always doing this? You're hard soil. The word's coming. I can be preaching fire right now because it is good. I'm going to tell you right now because it didn't come from me, so I'm going to listen to this later. But it can just bounce right off your forehead and land on the ground, and the enemy steals it immediately. Don't become critical. Don't allow what you've been through to harden your heart so that you're not soft and moldable to let God change and do things in your heart. Unforgiveness, pain, anger. Stony ground. Stony ground is a religious spirit. Stony ground is one that receives the word, acts all spiritual, quick to go, hey, amen, yes, oh, yeah, I'm deep. I know I get that. Yes, Lord, I receive. But there's no root system. There's, it's not grounded. It's not consistent. You have to find out the will of God for your life, plant yourself right there, and don't allow anything to stop what God's trying to do through you. You make a decision. I don't care what happens, what comes my way. Come on, the 80s preachers used to say, come hell or high water. That just means anything that happens, you're going to stay right there, and you're going to keep your face forward and say, I'm planted, and I'm going to do what God's told me to do, and I don't care if all hell breaks loose. I'm going to stay with my eyes forward because I'm not going to be moved off the will of God for my life. It's a tenacity you have to have. I've heard it called a bulldog tenacity. You ever seen a bulldog latch onto something? They don't let go. That's why they're so tough. They have jaws of steel, and they, and they will hold on. I mean, you could sling a bulldog around with a rope, and they won't let go. That's how your faith needs to look in the things of God. When you plant yourself in the kingdom of God and where God wants you, you stay there. So don't allow your heart to be moved by emotions or by outside situations. Thorny ground, seeking other things. Matthew 6, says, seek the kingdom first. The thorny ground chokes the word because it's seeking other things before the kingdom. It doesn't say you don't seek the kingdom. It's just not first. I go to church. I listen to Joel Osteen every three days. Oh, my gosh. Like, you know, I like Joyce Meyer. And so we think, man, we check that off. We're like, yeah, but is the kingdom first? Is God a part of your life or he is your life? Thank you. Good ground. Last one. Receptive to the word. Good ground is ground that's gone through a tilling process. The word till means uproot, turn over, break up, and cultivate. God has to bring you through a tilling process to get your ground right so he can produce a hundredfold return in your life. And sometimes that means you go through a breaking season. It's not comfortable. If you've been going through a breaking season, it's because God's preparing you for harvest in your life. So prioritize the word above all else. You must learn to receive the word before you can start sowing the word. Last scripture, Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. How? Not as something heard. A witness is something you see. The kingdom is revealed in demonstration. Religion is revealed in talk. The kingdom says you don't just hear the kingdom, you will see it. Jesus didn't just tell people he was the Messiah and he, and he loved them and God loved them. He showed them the kingdom of God. It's time to start seeing the word come alive and not just talking about it. The gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. We are in the last days. You listened to the message a few weeks ago. You'll see. I'm not saying it's tomorrow. I'm saying this generation, I believe with all my heart, is coming very, Jesus is coming soon. A lot is happening. Watch what's happening in Israel. You're about to see something in the next 12 months. It's going to happen. That's going to be a direct fulfillment of prophecy. And it's something I know from inside information. 
But what I'm telling you is God's doing, when the enemy's working overtime, the Bible says where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. So God's got a bigger plan, and he's working a lot more and doing a lot more than the enemy is. But most of us aren't seeing it right now because the enemy's trying to pull you away and distract you with this. Everyone stand up with me if you would. The kingdom grows through seed. Today I have delivered seed of the eternal word into your hearts. It's up to you to hold it, to cultivate it, to submit to it, and let it change your life. Just bow your head and close your eyes for a moment. I just want to pray over you today. I know a lot of you, the last three months has been a wild season of your life. I've been talking to you, and I understand because I've been going through it too. I mean, some of you have been furloughed from your jobs, or maybe you just started working again, or you've had uncertainty in your life, frustration. Come on, like I said, every week, you know, some of y'all have been homeschooling your kids, and you're like, Jesus, grace, grace, Lord, I need a miracle, right? But at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, the only thing that matters in this life is for you to fulfill that mission that Psalm 139 says was written in your mother's womb and put on the inside of you at birth to be who God's called you to be, to do what God's called you to do and to be in the perfect will of God for your life. Do not allow distractions of the age, the enemy trying to move you through fear, worry, or anxiety, don't allow any of those things to take you away from what God's wanting you to focus on. Like a bulldog, you grab on, you plant yourself, you're not moved by it. Don't let your opinions or your past hurts, stony ground, rocky ground, thorny ground, keep you from staying and doing what you're supposed to be doing. Because the Lord will work miracles through your life. Father, I pray right now that you would correct us right now, encourage us, Father. Lord, I just pray once again for healing over this nation, over the body of Christ. Lord, that we would come together like never before. Lord, that we begin to see the kingdom manifested in the earth. Father, we don't want to play church anymore. We don't want to just talk about it, God. We, we want to see you move in power. And so we submit to whatever you want to do in our life. As an open book, we say, God, just change us. Do surgery in our heart. Cut out things that don't need to be there. Make deposits where we need things to be put in, Father. Lord, do whatever you have to do inside of us so that we can reflect you properly in this earth and be who you've called us to be. Father, I thank you that your kingdom seed now is in their heart and it would germinate and begin to sprout even this week, Lord, and begin to prove the power of truth in their life, Father. Come on, with no one looking around, every head bowed and every eye closed. Those that are online, just stick with us for a few more moments. One day I'm going to stand before God and I'm going to give account for my life, just like all of us will. And he's going to not judge you based upon what you did in this life. Some of y'all say, well, I thought I was going to be judged based upon what I did, like all your mistakes and all that. Nope, not if you're a child of God. You will not be judged on that. Jesus took care of that. You will be judged on what you were called to do. So he's going to say, here's why I put you on this earth. Did you submit to it? Did you seek me? Did you understand the purpose? That's how he will judge you. So I am going to stand before God and he's say, Jason, did you fulfill your purpose? And one of the purposes that God has for me right now is to deliver truth to you and give you an opportunity to let the seed transform you from the inside out of the truth. With no one looking around, every head bowed, I just want this between you and God. You say, Pastor Jason, those online, you say, Pastor Jason, I'm, I heard your message today. A lot of it spoke to me. I know there's some things that I need to do in my life. But first of all, you're not sure 100% that if you died today, you'd spend an eternity in heaven. You're like, you said child of God, and I think I am. I've gone to church before. I've listened to preaching. I have a Bible. None of that qualifies you as a child of God. The scripture says the only thing that brings you into the household of God is believing in your heart what Jesus did 2,000 years ago, that he died on a cross and rose again on the third day for you to be saved and transformed and made a child of God and then confess with your mouth that he is Lord and say you believe. That's it. You don't have to earn it. And so I'm going to stand before God and say, Jason, did you tell him? And I'm going to be able to say, yes, Lord, you told me to and I did it. So no one looking around, I'm not going to call you up front. We don't do that here because this is a holy moment between you and God. But I want to know who I'm praying with right now. If you say, Pastor Jason, that's me. I want you to pray with me. I want to know that I'm saved. I want to know that if we were to step over into eternity right now, that I don't have one ounce of doubt that I'd spend an eternity in heaven and I'm a child of God. You can know that now just by believing your heart and confessing with your mouth. I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. If you say, that's me, no one looking around. I'll count to three. I want you to raise your hand up. Only I'm going to see you. You can put it down. One two, three, all around the room. Just lift your hand up. I see your hand. That's one. That's two. Anyone else? 
I see your hands. Three. Anyone else? Four. Come on. Five. Thank you, Jesus. Those of you that are watching online, I know this might sound funny to you, but God's watching you right now. I can't see you. You can see me. But I want you to just lift your hand up too. You say, that's me, Pastor, because God is looking at your heart. And I'm going to pray with all of you, and everyone in here is going to pray with five people in this room. Anyone else? A couple more seconds. This is your chance. I want to know I'm saved, Pastor. Five people. We're all going to pray together, and the Bible says when we pray and believe what we're saying, we're children of God. Then you are now a kingdom person. Say, Lord Jesus. Come on, everyone together. Lord Jesus, today I give you my life. I believe with all of my heart that 2,000 years ago, you died on the cross and you rose from the dead just for me. Thank you for saving me. And now from this moment forward, I will serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. It's not a magic.